Hi, I'm Chris Jones. I'm the director of outpatient palliative care at Duke Health. I'm going to talk to you today about talking. And my hope is that I can make it enjoyable while we still talk about something pretty complicated. We're going to think about having difficult conversations with our family members. I don't have any disclosures relevant to the presentation. And this will be our map for today. We're going to do four major things. We're going to start by defining communication and thinking about what that term means in terms of talking. We're going to talk about barriers to good communication. We'll think about active listening, which if you take nothing else from the presentation, if you're able to be a good active listener, you're going to be better at communicating. And the last piece is we'll do and think our way through five really concrete strategies for communicating with your family, but really it's the same story for communicating with anyone in your life. So we'll start by defining communication. I really like this quote, and that is that the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And you think about the times in your life where you've said, oh, I told him this, or, oh, I said that, and it didn't register, or you didn't say it as effectively as you imagined. These are all different times when the illusion that communication took place is really the problem. So I want to think about communication within some building blocks. And, and we see here, as we think about kids growing up specifically, and their language growth. The first thing that a little kid does, you have a baby, <laughs> initially they look at nothing, and then they start to meet your gaze, and then they start to play and find their hands and their feet. Then they can start to understand, but they're not really able to communicate in an effective way yet. Then they start making talking sounds, and then you really start to get some speech. So I want you to think about each of these building blocks for yourself. So as you interact with someone, as you try to communicate, especially when it's hard, the least you can do is pay attention. And then you kind of want to work your way up to effective speech. If we, if we think about communication, if you're feeling heard, you feel relaxed, it's a nice conversation, it's an easy flow. When it's clear that people are not hearing you, that you're being ignored, or that the conversation is mismatched, people get very stressed. And I think that trying to make sure that you think about how you feel when you're not heard that's a really important first step to making sure that you listen well. And really, I think about communication as very much a two-way street. So you're sending information out, they're sending information back, and there are words being said, there are motions, there's verbal communication, there's nonverbal communication. When this mismatch happens, when the two-way street isn't working, that is miscommunication. And miscommunication is something we all know, unfortunately, very well. Again, you think you've done, you think you've communicated, you think you've had a conversation, and it just didn't land. So just remember, communication doesn't happen until you've said it and they've understood it. Um, otherwise, you're just talking at each other. So if we think a bit about what makes communication go south, there are a few barriers to good communication. You'll notice at the bottom, there's a link to a, a website from the University of Delaware. And I think this does such a great job of framing the way to have these conversations, the strategies that you can use. And actually much of this, this presentation is built around that University of Delaware website. And that'll come up each time we see the map, that, um, that link will be on there. So no surprise, there are lots and lots of barriers to communication. 
we're going to go through four common ones. The first is assuming that you know what the other person is thinking. And you can imagine if someone's talking to you, especially if you aren't paying attention because, oh, I know this, I know this, I know why we're having this conversation, I know her underlying feelings about this. As soon as you start ignoring people, you run the risk of developing that miscommunication because, again, they're giving information out. And if you aren't taking it in, that's the first, the first way that this can fall apart. This is a really common problem here. When you're in a conversation with someone and when they're talking, you're spending your energy thinking about what you're going to say next. That is the recipe for miscommunication. If you're not taking in their information, you might be saying things really well, but if you're not understanding where they're coming from, you're going to have a really difficult time of it. So if folks know baseball, this is a picture of left field. And sometimes you're having a conversation and somebody says something from five years ago. Do you remember that time when you did this to mom? And you're 35 now, and that was when you were 11. And these unrelated topics can really get in the way of good communication. So whatever the topic at hand is, try to stay there. Stay out of left field, stay out of unrelated topics. And the last one that I think is really common that we run into is assuming that we know what's best for others. So this is where you're having a conversation about something difficult and you're going into that conversation with the goal of making somebody come out with a certain result or having a certain result at the end. And what I would say to you is if you walk into a difficult conversation with only one acceptable outcome, it's not going to go well. So these are those four elements together that we just looked at in the last four slides. Think for yourself, have you done any of these things? I have today and yesterday and the day before. So this is, this is something that is such a part of the human condition that we want to communicate well, but these hurdles get in the way. And what I would say to you, you, we've all heard the joke, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Well, you practice. Um, this is not something working through these communication barriers, trying to do this well. This is not something that comes naturally for a lot of people. And so really, every time you sit down to have a conversation, thinking about well, what's something that I can do in this conversation to be a little better than last time? If you know that you're somebody who is always thinking about the next thing to say and you're not listening as well, well, focus on that. And we'll talk a bit about the best ways to listen. There's this concept, and what, what we'll talk our way through here is something called active listening. And I want you to think about when you've been on the phone. So if you've been on the phone with your best friend, it's a conversation back and forth and back and forth and lots of energy. And you just, you talk for an hour and it feels like nothing. Think about that annoying relative who you talk to because they're blood, not because you wanna to talk to them. That's a much harder conversation. So these, in my mind, are the five levels of listening. And I, I think about this with my kids as well. The, the lowest one is the, just that you ignore them. Dad, 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 dad. Can I have $7 to buy a Pokemon card? Dad, 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 dad. That card is in Japan, and $7 will not help you to get it. So I'm just going to ignore that. The next step up is pretend listening, where you go, uh-huh, uh-huh. This may well be how you deal with that annoying relative. You put the phone on speaker, you watch the television, and you lean in every once in a while and say, uh-huh. Again, these are not good ways to listen. The next step up is selective listening. 
where there's some ah ahaing. And then when the topic is something that you're interested in, you really jump in and dig in. Attentive listening, I think, is what most of us land at. This is the, I'm doing my best. Attentive listening is a natural way to listen. It's listening, it's hearing, it's not speaking before you understand. It's it's that conversation with your friend. Attentive listening is the listening you do when listening is easy and enjoyable. But the next step up is active listening. Active listening is hard. Active listening has several components, and these are really intentional skills. They're things that you have to work your way through to do it well. These are not things that come naturally to most people. So let's let's unpack these a bit and think about how can we become successful active listeners. The first step is to make sure that you're listening and paying attention. There are a couple of elements to this. If you're on your cell phone, you're not paying attention. If the TV is on, you're not paying attention. So reducing those distractions. The other thing is if you start talking to people or listening like this, or you turn your body away, anything that you do that says to the the other person in the conversation, I'm closed off to you. I'm not here for this. I'm here because I have to be. That's going to make the listening and the whole conversation a whole lot dif- a whole lot more difficult. The the next is to really pay attention not just to the words, but pay attention to the emotions also. When we know that we're in the midst of a difficult conversation, it's really easy to just kind of plow forward. There's this idea in communication science that there are these two kind of pathways. There's an informational pathway and there's an emotional pathway. And the emotional pathway is more powerful and it's also faster. So if you're in the midst of a conversation and the emotions are really flying up, you can't just ignore them and do the informational part of the conversation. Because if people are sad or scared or angry, they're not going to be able to hear you. And you're going to be stuck in the emotional channel. Truthfully, you're wasting your time. The entire conversation is going to have to happen again. There's this idea, we've all heard of fight or flight. And there's actually a third element that I think is important to understand. So we all know fight or flight when things get hard. There's actually freeze is another one. And if you're in the midst of a conversation and the person doesn't fight with you or they don't leave the room, but they just freeze there, it's really easy to think that the conversation is going well, that they're taking information in. If you miss the emotions, though, you're going to miss the fact that they're on that emotional channel and they're not able to do the informational bits. The last piece that I'll encourage you in this second part of active listening is don't try to decide what's right and what's wrong. Hear the information, take it in, pay attention to the emotion, and we'll deal with right or wrong a little bit later. The third option, or the third piece is responding. Really here, it's easy to just spurt something out. But what I'd encourage you to do is think for a beat or two before you reply. So again, we've heard what they've said. We've blocked our distractions. We've listened well. And now we're going to reply. If there's an emotion there, name it. Or acknowledge it. Or do something rather than just gloss over it. If you ignore the emotions when you're speaking, they're going to stay in that emotional space. The other thing is, is there some elephant in the room that's not being said? If someone has talked to you, but there's clearly the big thing is still dangling in the conversation, you're going to have to deal with it. You may have to bring it up. The, The fourth 
item here is to clarify. So they've spoken, you've spoken. In an ideal world, we're both kind of knit together and we know what, what the goals are. But oftentimes, something is said that just doesn't fit. This is that left field idea again. What doesn't make sense? Ask that question to get clarity. Because if you don't have clarity, it's really hard to join together and and go forward to make a plan. Last one, we don't do this as well as, as I think we should. You've heard what you've heard. You've said what you've said. They've heard what they've heard. They've said what they said. All of those things could be could have a difficult time fitting together. So what I'm going to recommend is that you say something along the lines of, what I'm hearing you say is, and then do your best to summarize. If there's a lot of emotion, for example, if you're talking to your parent about having to go to the assisted living or the nursing home because they're not safe or have help brought in, mom, it sounds like talking about anything that might get in the way of your independence is really upsetting for you. It is amazing when people feel heard. This is back from the original couple of slides. When people feel heard, they're able to dig in and go forward with you. And this summarization is the spot where you can really make sure that the other person feels heard. And then the last piece is when you're sharing, this is kind of that coming together to, to move forward. Avoid giving advice. Avoid preaching at the person you're talking to. And what I really recommend, especially if the conversation's been hard, thank them for something. Because if it was hard for you, it was likely hard for them. Saying, boy, this is not what either of us were hoping to do tonight thanks for coming over. Thanks for talking about this. Thanks for helping me to come up with some plans. Thanks for listening to me because I've been struggling with this for a month or a year. Any way where you can make somebody feel heard and then summarize and and thank them for digging in with you, is those are all ways where conversations, even if they're hard conversations, can go forward together. We have one more part of the map, and this is a little bit of a bigger one. What I was really hoping I could do for folks today is have you leave with a really concrete roadmap for how to communicate. Because it's easy to say, be a good listener, be an active listener, but how do you get started? (laughs) What do you do? What does this look like? So what I'm going to try to do is give a five-step approach for how to communicate successfully with family. The The first thing to remember is the bigger the group gets, the more complex the conversation gets. This picture is actually from a website about forming a band. And you can imagine if you're a solo act, It's pretty easy. You have a meeting with yourself, you decide what you want to do, and you move forward. Once your band is a duet, it gets a little more complicated. If your band is a trio, now you have three relationships instead of just one relationship. You get to four people, your band turns into a a quartet, and those four people now have six relationships to navigate. This, in my mind, is what families look like. Families have just this web of relationships, but it's not like getting the guitarist and the drummer and the singer together for the band. These are people who have long histories and sometimes long memories. So this, I really like this web here because sometimes in families, there's this group and there's this group, and you see in, in this picture, number five is the, the peacemaker, trying to keep everybody linked together. So I think it's, it's really important when you're communicating that you establish lines of communication. You can't just assume that the 10 people in the family are all going to hear the right thing or are all going to be on the same page. 
So you have to figure out who your stakeholders are, figure out who from the group, from the family needs to be part of the conversation. And then if you can get everybody together in person, that's great. That can be hard with the pandemic. Sometimes people are doing things over Zoom. Sometimes people are doing things over a group text, but some way that people can communicate and all have the same information. That's the first strategy in my mind. The second strategy, we're back in left field again, but we're, we're thinking here in a different way. So this is the left field of the ballpark in Durham. And if you look at this picture, you might notice a little tiny yellow line up at the top. And if folks are comfortable or, or they've been around a baseball field, there are nooks, there are crannies, there are funny things. And one of the rules in baseball is before the game, you set your ground rules. And your ground rules in the Durham Bulls Athletic Park is anything that bounces under that yellow line is still in play. It's the same as bouncing off the wall. If you get it over that yellow line, it's a home run. It's actually really similar when you're having a conversation with your family, especially if it's going to be a hard conversation. Set ground rules up front. And I like this slide in particular because it gives you the what to do and it gives you the what not to do. So here are the rules for fighting fair. You identify the problem. That's the thing we're going to talk about. You then focus some time on the problem. Remember from our active listening slide, we've got a few steps to try to focus on the problem. You're careful to discuss the problem and not the person. Because as soon as you start discussing the person rather than the problem, you're going to open up all the old wounds. Listen with an open mind. Hopefully that rings a bell around the active listening part. You're going to deal with the emotions, exactly like we talked about earlier. And if you've messed up at any point, own it. It's hard to move forward when we're defensive, when somebody feels like we're not taking our mistakes seriously. The fouls here are really important also. And if you name when a foul happens, that's the first step. And sometimes you just need to name it and the other person will say, you're right, that wasn't fair. Sometimes you just have to take a break for a few minutes and everybody takes a walk, cooler heads prevail, you come back together. So remember, our first step is we're going to open lines of communication. We're going to get the right people together. And now strategy number two, we're going to set very clear ground rules. So if you take a look at this picture, I think you can see something that some families may find familiar, and that is that everybody is talking and nobody is listening. So the third strategy here is to make sure that everyone has a turn to be heard. Give people a chance to share. If that's in order, if that's just a natural conversation, make sure that assuming you have the right stakeholders, if you've got somebody sitting quietly in the corner, ask them for their thoughts. Because if you don't pull people in in the time when you're dealing with the problem, it's going to be really hard to get a solution that's acceptable to them. And again, use those active listening skills. The way that you let people be heard is by listening. It's the only way because communication is a two-way street. The fourth strategy of our five is once you've gotten everybody on the same page, then you move forward towards solutions. And I, I love this African proverb, and that is, if you want to go fast, you go alone. And there are many of us, we could solve this problem in one second, but it's not a durable solution if you haven't gotten everybody else who needs to be on board on board. So you can go fast alone, but you can't go far. And so 
making sure that you get everybody together before you move towards solutions, that's the way you can actually get far into a solution. And then when you think about solutions, I want you to think about three bad ways to hit a solution and then one that you really should aim for. So one of the solutions, if you come up with a problem amongst two people, is my way or the highway, I win, you lose. Nobody comes out of that as the loser feeling like they've been heard or that they're valued. The flip side is you win, I lose. It's the same problem in reverse. Potentially the worst one is just that you burn it all down and there's mutual destruction and you don't talk to each other for five years and everyone holds a grudge. And I I've seen families fall apart over what really look like minor things because what they didn't do was try to figure out how to get to a win-win. So this is really pretty concrete here. If you're trying to set up a win-win, name what you think they want. And if you get it wrong, they'll tell you. But what I think you want is this. What I think you want is this. What I want is this. How can we all get a piece of what's important to us? This maybe isn't the way to negotiate in business, where there are often winners and losers. But in families, there can't be losers in families. It just isn't a way that you'll be able to stay together. So if you give people a chance to lay out what's important to them, brainstorm solutions. And some of these solutions will be awful. But all you're doing is you're trying to take a list. You're trying to get everything on the sheet of paper so that everybody's ideas can be heard. And once you have that list of potential solutions, you try to figure out which one or multiple of those would get you to an acceptable place for everybody. So think about, would any of these or would some combination of these solve the problem we're discussing? Would we actually do it? And then how hard or easy or expensive would this be? So if you can get to everybody feeling heard, a summarization in your mind of what everyone wants, some potential solutions, and then pick from that basket something that's agreeable to everyone, then you're probably going to be in a good spot with a durable way forward. And I think about this, this is a picture of the Blue Ridge Parkway out west in uh, North Carolina. What you're trying to do is you're trying to create a roadmap for the future. The roads aren't straight. But if you know what direction you're going, then as the road twists, as the road turns, you're all in the proverbial car together. And you're all able to be part of the next solution that needs to come together. If you win and they lose, or if you both lose, there's no way to go together and continue to solve problems. So it's a lot of information for a half an hour. What I'm going to summarize for you is remember that communication is a two-way street. It doesn't happen when something leaves your mouth. It only happens when the receiver catches it. There are tons of barriers to communication, but most of them can be dealt with using active listening, which is hard and takes practice. And the last piece is if you think of those five concrete strategies listed here, you have a way to take your conversation, take your discussion, and get to a mutually agreeable, acceptable point. So I, I'll end here. I have my email on the slide, and I'm happy for questions. My wife will tell you I'm the worst therapist out there. So if you got stuff with your family, I promise you I'm not your guy. If you have potential solutions and you want to run them by somebody who is a totally disinterested observer, um, feel free, and, and I'm happy to help if I can. Thanks very much.